Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Hunnack, Chair of the Webinar Committee. It does feel like it's been a while since we've done one of these. Um, I hope all of you that were in Aberdeen have recovered from our annual conference and you'll be glad to know that there are no planned fire drills today. I'm pleased to welcome you to another SRP Lunchtime webinar in association with AURPO. Today's exciting topic is Fusion, the current state of play. So as always, the ground rules, we will be recording this and putting it on our YouTube channel after, after the webinar is finished. If you're not already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can get our numbers up, thanks. Questions uh, will be asked at the end of the presentation. There should be a little box on the top right hand side of your screen. So if you ask the question there, other people can then see it and you can like questions that you would like answering. So at the end, we'll go through as many as possible, starting with the most liked first. Any that don't get, we don't get a chance to answer today will pop on the website afterwards. For CPD points, you can email the code uh, shown on the screen now to the email shown on the screen. We'll pop that in the chat box as well, so you can note it down later as well. And at the end, we'll send you a feedback form. So please, please fill that in because it's really handy to know what we're doing well, what we can improve on, what topics you'd like to see in these webinars going forward. So if you've not already seen it, uh, we've got an issue of radiation protection today, our magazine out. Uh, it's on the internet. You can check it out on that website below issue four. Uh, and we've also got our special 60th anniversary issue coming up soon in summer. So lastly, I'd just like to plug joining the SRP if you're not already a member. We've got loads and loads of benefits if you're a member. Um, uh, so you can pop onto our website and click on membership and that will give you all the instructions on how to join. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to past SRP president and current AURPO president, Pete Cole, to introduce our speaker for today. Over to you, Pete. Thanks, Sarah. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, sorry, just getting a phone call coming through. I uh, hope everybody can hear me and uh, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome and introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. Thomas Davis is the President and Chief Technology Officer of Sigma, Oxford Sigma, which is a research company that develops fusion materials technology whilst providing technical materials and regulatory support to the nuclear and fusion industry. He holds multiple patents and has published over 10 fusion related scientific papers. He has a PhD in material science from the University of Oxford. So without any further ado, Thomas, I will hand over to you and speak to you later. Thank you. Um, let me just go, let me just go share my screen. Can you see that? Everyone good? Okay, All right. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction, uh, Pete, and thank you uh, to the organization for inviting me to present here today on the current uh, state of play of fusion energy. Um, so my presentation will be about, you know, approximately 45 minutes long. I'll cover off uh, what kind of going on in the market today, where we are, and then talk a bit more about some of the um, things which are more relevant to the radiological protection, sort of the radiation aspects of it, what we work on. And then at this time at the end, I'll talk about Oxford Sigma in a, in a one or two slides um, to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, but yes, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm Tom Davis. Um, I was the you know, president and co-founder of a SME-based uh, company in we're based in Harwell campus in Oxfordshire. Um, and uh, like I said, you know, I co-founded this company um, whilst uh, completing my PhD at Oxford University, uh, looking specifically at fusion materials. Um, we were founded on the principle of um, you'll see in a minute um, fusion um, uh, is, is evolving both commercially but also technically and uh, we saw a gap in, in the need for specifically fusion materials related to stuff for where the high high temperature high radiation dose regions are uh, so we, we we kind of focus on that area we do our own technology development in, in, in that aspect and innovating there but it also provides some services to industry um, I'll talk about that at the end but the this talk will mainly go through some of the so high level stuff at the beginning and then kind of um, uh, get more detail as we go through. Um, so this is really high level, but right, the, right the, the, the kind of the, the aim of the game 
really about fusion, but energy in general. Um, this is a, a graph that I um, took from Google, um, Google, but all you really need to see is that the time scales is what we're considering here. Um, so if you look at the X axis here is the in, in years and scale of a thousand, and obviously we're in the 2000 era. Um, and fossil fuel energy, as we know, is a limited resource on the earth um, over the thousand year period. And so to um, meet the demands of our electricity consumption in, in the world, which is only going to increase, um, as you see on the green line, um, which is the prediction of non-fossil fuel energy. Uh, this is obviously renewables and things like that. Uh, fission will fit into there, but also has a, a lifetime of how much uranium there is available. Um, and fusion is seen as the um, sort of the holy grail of uh, energy source, or at least domestically on, on Earth. Um, because it uses majority a um, deuterium or tritium or uh, a different type of fuel, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it's about that longevity of the energy source for the for the uh, thousand years to come. And recent changes in at least recent innovations in technology in the last uh, 20 years has kind of uh, given hope for the acceleration of the commercialization of fusion energy to become more of a reality rather than a science project. But I'll dive into a little bit of that. Um, and so um, Give you the bit of like where we are today. So this is the headliner, you know, what why we're doing what we're doing. Um, fusion is obviously a nuclear fusion process. Uh, it's about merging or uh, fusing two atoms together, uh, two isotopes together. Here, this is just a picture of the sun from NASA, um, and this is what you're doing proton proton fusion. Um, it's contained and it's confined by its own gravitational pull, as is significant mass body of mass um, pulls on itself to enough where it forces two hydrogen atoms together. Um, so you get this sustainable reaction on Earth. We don't have that luxury of having the gravitational at all. Um, so the aim of the game uh, really for us um, and for where we sit and where all the companies sit on fusion is to put that in a box on Earth somehow in some way. Um, how you do fusion and what is fusion? So I mentioned before, so you, the easiest way on, on, on Earth so far is to fuse deuterium, which is a nice type of hydrogen, to H on the left there and then Three hydrogen, which is also known as tritium, which has two neutrons and a proton. Um, you fuse them together and you get out helium and a neutron. And the idea is to extract the neutron's energy, which comes off uh, in a sort of a blanket sort of scenario where you blanket with a material which gets heated up by the neutron. And then the helium itself is put back into the fusion reaction to keep the heat there to continue the um, uh, reaction between the fusion particles. Um, and on the on the graph on the right here, this is a cross section. So this is basically the efficiency um, of reaction rates occurring at a function of temperature of the plasma. And you can see the temperature there is in billions of Kelvin. Um, but what you're basically looking for is the highest point on the graph, but on the left hand side. So you want the lowest temperature possible with the highest reaction rate to ensure that you have enough um, uh, energy being produced to make a sustainable reaction. And there's different forms. This is not all of the forms of, uh, of fusion type fuel you can use on, on Earth. Um, but you see DT, which is deuterium tritium, is the easiest possible. That's why it's pursued majority by most of the companies and public uh, fusion in the world. You can do deuterium tritium, DD, uh, but it just requires either a higher temperature to achieve similar reaction rates. Um, and then deuterium helium-3 is another one which has been pursued. Um, helium-3 is an isotope of helium, stable isotope. Uh, but there's very little or non-existent on Earth, and it's hard to um, get hold of being free. Now, other reactions I'm going to ignore um, because it, um, we're just going to focus mainly on DT because that's most of the efforts people are, are, are pursuing. How do we fuse things on Earth? There's three main methods, and they can come to categories. So this one is called the most common and most uh, well-known and well-studied uh, is magnetic confinement fusion. And this idea is confining the, the fusion plasma by magnetic fields. Um, whereas I mentioned the sun uh, confines it by gravitational pull, we haven't got that luxury here, so we can confine it by magnetic fields because a plasma is charged, so you can manipulate a charge via magnetic fields. And the basic configuration, we won't go into too much what they look like, but you essentially have a central solenoid of a magnet which forces a current through the plasma in its radial direction. Uh, if you can just see my mouse moving around. And then you also then, it's an unstable plasma, so you need to stabilize it by confining it by using these D shaped. Um, toroidal field coils, and then we've got this the gray ones here, poloidal, and then there's some correction coils. We end up making a, um, a donut shaped plasma, which is um, self-containing. Uh, and that's the most uh, common approach so far to do fusion. And we have successfully conducted fusion. And what we haven't demonstrated in magnetic confinement yet is whether you can reduce more energy out than you put into the plasma. 
um, that is um, on the schedule for this decade if we uh, achieve it. Um, other types of fusion, uh, this is called a natural confinement fusion, which is about you naturally confine the fuel and you compress it by shockwaves. Um, those shockwaves can be um, compressed by uh, lasers, uh, X-ray ablation um, from, from various materials with lasers impacted on them. There's a couple of ways of doing it. Um, this has achieved net gain, so net gain here is uh, Q greater than one, which I'll talk about a bit later, but this is the, you remember in the news about December time this uh, last year, uh, the National Ignition Facility in the United States are uh, able to achieve net gain through this method of approach. And you're confining a very small amount of fuel in a very small space of time and you compress it and then it uh, fuses and gives off neutrons. And the idea is to capture the energy of the neutron. Then you've got some hybrid between them, what we call magneto inertial confinement fusion. Um, there's many different ways of doing it, but it's the same principle is about confining uh, fuel in the center and then compressing it. Um, by a method, um, there's multiple methods to do so, um, and I'll, I'll go into a few, but there is uh, significant levels and different uh, sort of design designs for it. Um, but on the whole, that's the majority of the three approaches that we take um, on Earth to uh, fusion, and mostly using deuterium tritium. There are others in this which um, fit in, like uh, magnet mirrors and other things that I just won't go into because it's not enough time. But there are other companies trying to pursue slightly different ways of doing fusion, but the idea is confining a plasma, either heating it up to a temperature which can fuse or compressing it to a, to a um, density when it can fuse as well. Um, oh, and there's a, uh, this is the formula, it's called um, Lawson Criteria. Essentially, the way uh, we think about producing fusion on a very high level is you have the density of the plasma, which is N, times by the temperature of the plasma, and times by its confinement time, and there has to be that summation has to be greater than this for dt a particular number and if you can achieve that um this will tell you that things will fuse um so we're all aiming to do that and each method you see on the screen um has a different way of playing with n t and tau uh so the density in the in the uh, on the left hand side of the map confinement pretty low where it's very high in the natural confinement on the very right in the, in the magnetic natural is a bit of the middle uh time which is the tau part of confinement on the magnetic confinement on the left. The time is very long, um, hours, years. Uh, that's that's the concept behind it. Whereas more on the right is the opposite. The time is very, very small. But the density is very high. So you end up playing with these three parameters uh, to be able to achieve fusion. And that's the principal basis for reactor design for fusion. On it. Um, this slide's out of date, um, but it's 2022, so it's the best we've got so far. Um, so companies building fusion for power production, or so companies, private in, private entities, as we say, are the mission of these company mission is to demonstrate fusion um, energy, but also demonstrate electricity or some sort of form of useful energy output from a fusion reactor. Um, there's, as you can see, there's a spread of companies. There's probably a bit more now. There's actually a couple more in, in Europe. There's one in Sweden since this has been made in 2020. Two, so at least one year later, there's a Swedish company we know of, and there's a couple more European companies. And there's a uh, there's another US company being made, um, but as you can see, there's quite a few spreads, and you can see the majority of the um, fusion companies are based in the United States being effectively one. But this is slightly out of date. Um, it's just increased is is the way to do it. This is a very you can I, I'm not really going to go through this in depth, but this is more of a um uh, a, a friend of mine, Derek Sutherland, who's a um, uh, CEO of a fusion company, um, put an organizational chart together of all the various companies in the last 10 years pursuing fusion. And you can confine it as, as I mentioned right at the top, the approach to fusion. So if it's magnetic confinement or a natural confinement, then how you operate it, if it's continuous or pulsed. And that's that tau part, that timing part. So if the time is very long, it's continuous operation, or if it's pulsed, it's very short. And then in a continual operation, you don't need to compress the plasma to achieve the density you need, so you can have a non-compression approach. Whereas a pulse one, to achieve loss and criteria, you need, to, you need to compress the plasma to get the density required. And there's very different technologies to do that. And you can follow it all down. I won't go into too much. The, the reason why this is even here is just to give you a bit of an idea that there is a lot of companies out there doing a lot of different ways of doing fusion with different fuel types, different compression types, and different fundamental approaches to fusion. Not one here is clear which one is going to be successful. Um, there is more knowledge and experience with, for example, magnetic fusion energy uh, through through the decades compared to others. 
Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be successful in terms of producing electricity. We just don't know that yet. We are still developing that as a community. Um, so the idea behind this is to give you a bit of a plethora of what was going on. I, there's a lot going on, a lot of activity, a lot of exciting. Um, so now the this next part is going to talk about public fusion. Um, so this is the government's approach to fusion energy um, and sort of mainly going to focus more around the United States, Europe uh, and uh, UK. They will have slightly different defined projects. So I'm not going to go back way too much in time, but the current um, sort of uh, largest government program right now, which is operational, is the Joint European Taurus, which is currently a column in Oxfordshire, uh, operated by the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority on behalf uh, of the European Union. Um, and it's been called Joint European Taurus, which has been operating since the 80s to, um, to this decade. And it's produced many worldwide records of deuterium tritium as a demonstrator of a tokamak based device or in this case magnetic combined fusion here and you can see that that's an actual image of it um where they actually do real deuterium tritium fusion and they're doing it today like this 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 year they're still continuing doing that cycle to demonstrate um uh fusion um next post that what the since the since the 90s um there's been a world effort called uh to build a a technology demonstrator for fusion um, and it looks like it's called ITER, 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 however you want to pronounce it. Um, it is in South France, currently under construction. Um, those dates are slightly wrong. It's DD plasma, it's a bit more, not, it's not now 2025, but it's a bit longer. It's been delayed by various reasons, um, but it's funded by 35 countries. So this is um, funded by United States, uh, European Union, uh, Russia, India, China, Japan, Korea, and the list goes on. Um, so it's a really international organization. Uh, come together to, uh, to build. I'm pretty sure it's the largest international project currently underway, uh, at least science project. Um, it was as large as the LHC um, and uh, so it's underway. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. So the mission for that is to produce more energy out than in uh, from deuterium tritium plasmas. As you can see, you can see that donut shape in the middle there. Um, and this is the world's effort of integrating all the different technologies which have been developed independently around the world and bringing them together um, uh, to demonstrate that um, you can have a pathway towards energy. It will, one thing it will not do is produce electricity. It will produce heat, which will be dumped um, into, the, into the atmosphere. And then post that, the public fusion piece, at least in the European Union, um, is that energy demonstration will be beyond 2040, 2050, 2060, uh, depending who you ask. And the idea is to take the ITER design and then down select technologies, which were successful, and then build a sort of demonstration power plant. Uh, and that's what uh, the European Union's effort with Eurofusion um, is currently on the way of doing. There are other national programs. So the United States has a different program which we're talking talk about. And then you also got uh, the South Koreans have a different program, same with Japan, for example, India and Russia. Um, but that's a very high level view of where fusion is. But uh, we'll go to just a couple of pictures about ITER. Um, this is that world large uh, science project. And it's being built in Cadarache, France, if you see on the map there, so just in the southern, in the south area, south France. Uh, this is a picture from March 2009 where they um, prepped the site for the construction. And we've got a picture in uh, just uh, under 10 years later. Um, this is the, uh, 2018 December. This is the current, this is the level of construction. So this is where the tokamak or the magnetic fusion reactor will sit. Um, and then they got an assembly hall behind it where they're building it and putting it over uh, bit by bit. They got uh, various buildings in the distance about magnet windings and uh, cryostat construction. And on the on the right, more very far right, uh, the electrical distribution. Uh, you can see it's fully underway. It's a very large construction site. And cost wise, um, the last estimate I have seen, it's it's between 25, 25 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, I believe it's been uh, it's been committed uh, to it. But in May 2022, uh, so quite recent, they've um, part of that pit you saw. Um, they've now obviously advanced quite further and they've start putting the in the middle you see a central column that's the support that's the support structure for the magnet to go in which is superconducting whereas you've got the d-shaped sort of vacuum vessel component there's going to be obviously segments of them and they're all going to come together and join so you can see it's kind of large very large scale engineering um and it's fully underway um so um that will uh, uh come together nicely over the over the years to come uh, this is the latest photo uh, ish you know, about March time. Um, as you can see, things have changed slightly. So the assembly hall is now uh, being built over the what's called the Tokamak pit, where the Tokamak is. Um, and you can see various components being constructed. You've got the magnet winding 
uh, assembly hall behind here as well. You've got various auxiliary systems. So it's fully underway. Um, again, this is the public program. Um, I'm going to compare this to the private industry in a minute, but this is what the public uh, are doing and the world's governments are putting together. So now focus on the UK. Uh, in uh, late 2019, um, we, the UK government, uh, had funded a program for the UK Atomic Energy Authority called STEP, which is um, titled Spherical Top Mac for Energy Production. And the idea behind STEP is it, uh, the government gave uh, the authority £220 million pounds to develop a prototype uh, concept reactor um, for the end of next year um, with the intent to deliver that reactor by 2040 uh, to demonstrate a commercial viability pathway for fusion. So this is a fully fledged uh, magnetic confinement uh, reactor being led by the UK Atomic Energy Authority, uh, engagement with all the industry around it, uh, which we are one of the members of. Um, and it's about demonstrating a fully integrated uh, fusion reactor, which will produce electricity um, and demonstrate its commercial viability. So it's really um, a centralized, uh, at least the UK's supply chain, uh, focused on pursuing um, uh, fusion in the UK. They have identified a site um, which is going to be in West Burton up in Nottinghamshire. Um, so the site's been identified where it's going to be. It's going to be on one of the old coal fired power stations uh, operated by EDF Energy, which just now closed down. So they're going to uh, remove that and then uh, over the 2030s start the construction of what is called STEP. Um, latest news about this is in the 6th of February 2023, it was announced um, uh, that a company was made, uh, a spin out company from the UK Atomic Energy Authority called UK Industrial Fusion Solutions Limited, uh, which will take on the responsibility of delivering that reactor uh, to the government um, in that time frame. So it's, gonna, it's, it's coming, spinning out from the National Lab and then becoming its own uh, entity, where again, it, it's, it will build the world's first prototype fusion energy plant um, at West Bratton, Nottinghamshire. It's got a lot of support from government um, and um, it's uh, essentially full steam ahead with the design right now uh, and a development and, and engaged in supply chain to be able to deliver this type of reactor by 20, you know, by 2040. It is ambitious, um, but it may be what's needed to get fusion um, actually uh, on the grid, at least in principle and in demonstration form. Um, uh, this is again, we're still talking about public organizations, so this is government approaches to fusion. Um, I will uh, go on to what private are doing in a minute. Uh, but another result, which I mentioned earlier, but this is a bit more explicit. So in the 13th of December last year, um, the US government announced that they reached ignition. Ignition means um, more energy released from the fusion than new energy put into the fuel itself. Um, it's not the energy you put into the system and then lose all the efficiencies into the fuel. It's about the energy going into the actual fuel itself. So it's called scientific break even. Um, it's a thing that everyone's been chasing uh, since fusion has ever been uh, thought of, and we achieved it as uh, in in that time. Uh, this is laser fusion, so using fusion, using lasers into a chamber where you, uh, in this case, the lasers impact on a, you see, it's like a gold. It's called a gold holorum, uh, which then uh, emits X rays inside the pellet, and the pellet deuterium tritium fro frozen fuel, and it compresses the pellet via the um, uh, ablation. Um, and by the X-ray compression. Uh, this was uh, proven, so you, they uh, had a shot where they um, released 3.15 megajoules of energy from DT and they put in only 2.05 megajoules, so that gives about a Q of 1.5. Um, so that's the first time that's been achieved. Um, that was by inertial fusion, we haven't achieved that yet in magnet confinement fusion. Um, uh, and that's what ITER's role uh, is going to produce as well, along with the, dem the technology demonstration. So now, regulation updates is something worth talking about, being made aware of about how um, fusion is coming along. So in the UK, you know, STEP was announced in 2019. Um, back then, the UK landscape for regulation of a fusion device was not settled. It was not clear in the UK law who had the jurisdiction of regulating a fusion device. Um, whether it was the Office for Nuclear Regulation or whether it was Health and Safety Executive, uh, it was a bit of um, ambiguity in, in the in the UK law. Uh, the law was laid down in the, in the 60s, uh, and it was never um, thought about fusion as a as a particular particular uh, potential energy source at the time. So, 
part of the steps mission and part of uh, UK's obligation policy's role is to, um, you know, and, and part of the supply chain is to, to, to come together and, and work out what is the appropriate way to regulate uh, fusion. Um, and the, the at least the, the consensus agreement is that because fusion doesn't have similar um, safety concerns as fission, for example, like meltdown potentials in, in a fission reactor, they just don't exist in fusion um, because it's completely different physics. Um, there was a, a three, as you can see here on the page, three, three basically reports from government uh, in October and then December and then June, uh, October 21, December 21. So the one on the left is basically the government strategy, and that's the first time a government has really laid down the strategy on how to get fusion from science to a commercial sort of industry. Um, it was written out very clearly. You can see the intent of government. And along with that, on the middle report is about the sort of um, response from public about the consultation, which is very interesting to read if you're interested. And on the far right is kind of uh, their responses and sort of what's going to happen next. Um, and the main uh, sort of outcome is that it just determines that uh, the health and safety regulation, uh, health and safety executive in the UK um, will regulate fusion uh, as well as the environmental agency on the environment side, which is what vision is anyway. So. But one of the things they're going to do is currently still down in Parliament. They are going to amend the Nuclear Installations Act 1965 uh, to explicitly remove fusion out of the Nuclear Installations Act, which is what the jurisdiction becomes uh, for a nuclear site. Um, and you can see here, this is if you ever like, this is what the law it hasn't been voted in yet. Um, but basically, it removes fusion from a fission site um, with some stipulations and stuff. Um, there was an outstanding question, um, you know, what are the implications of the modification? Um, since fusion is still under development, we haven't fully understood or fully seen the accident scenarios and various things. So there are ways um, uh, in, the white, in the white paper, this paper before, it does talk about that. If there's any new information that is learned and uh, kind of um, determines that this is not an appropriate way of using regulation, then then, then there is a way to, to mitigate that. So that's the kind of UK land, that landscape, and it's very much signal to the world saying this is a place to do fusion and this is a place to have private industry uh, working on fusion in this country because the regu regulatory regime is, I mean, the most important part of the regulatory regime is that it is um, determined. We know what it is, we know where we go, we know how to do it. Uh, before this happened, it was a bit of amb ambiguity, so you didn't know what the rules and regulations were applied to. Um, to design your reactor to. So now it's at least it's confirmed and it provides a lot of certainty in the industry. So going over the pond to the United States, um, this is a very, very quick way of what's happening in the United States. Um, so there was an act in 2018, uh, it's called NEMA, basically says fusion is going to be regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the equivalent to the U UK regulator. There's been quite a few funding programs in the US. Um, but I'm not going to mention them here, but there are quite a few for, for, uh, funding programs for specifically fusion as well. Um, but the most important part to, to note is there's two things what kind of has happened in the United States, which is now um, uh, really put their stake in the ground on fusion energy uh, as a potential energy source for the future. The first one is that pink box on the screen, developing a bold decadal vision for commercial fusion energy. So the White House sets out, that's what the picture on the left looks like set out their vision for the next 10 years of where they see fusion as a commercial entity. Um, this is one of the rare times when the White House actually puts out um, a statement to say we want to see something in 10 years time uh, happen. We know it's going to be very hard and it's going to be very difficult, but this is what the government wants to see the industry uh, rise up to. Um, it's very rare to find the White House to do this. They generally have a step back and allow things to happen by the private commercial sense. Um, the last time this really happened in a, in a, in a sort of a uh, yes, a, um, uh, public session was uh, the uh, race to the moon from Kennedy. Um, so this is the beginnings of it, at least. Um, along with that, they announced what we what they call a public private partnership cost share program, um, which is called a milestone based program. There's an update. I'm going to go into that. But what that really means is how SpaceX won the contract with NASA's commercial orbital transportation services. So they managed to end up um, US government basically um, fostered a space industry um, from nothing to where it is today by using this uh, sort of commercial model, which is um, uh, in this case called COTS. So the White House and mm -hmm. Department of Energy is basically modeling a private public partnership uh, milestone based program for fusion, which I'll talk about in a sec, what that really means. Um, the awards were announced last week. 
Um, and it's the beginnings of that program to be able to put fusion, at least a demonstrated fusion plant in the United States on the grid um, in the next 10 years. That's, that's the intent of it. Um, and the last thing to know about regulation is that uh, in the US, um, this happened for the UK in, 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 um, in 2021, but in the United States, it was only confirmed in 18, 18th of April how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the US will regulate fusion. And they decided right now it's going to be regulated like any other accelerator facility, like a science project, and it will not come under the current fission regulations. So that's a big milestone and it provides a lot of certainty for the industry in America as well. So that's now being confirmed. Um, so that's the sort of, you know, uh, important stake in the ground as well for America. So now you know the certainty of what the regulatory regime looks like. Um, so now, next part, we'll talk about private fusion um, a bit more in explicit terms. Um, I'll, I'll whisper through this as much as I can. So in 2021, there's a, 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 an industry uh, association called the uh, Fusion Industry Association, FIA, uh, based in Washington, D.C., who um, puts these reports together where they have a, like, sort of the global, they sum up all the current companies in, the, in, in fusion in the world and kind of try to summarize how much money they've received from venture capitalists in sort of their mission and goals and things like that's very useful for and i highly recommend reading them they come out once a year the 2023 edition is not out yet but it'll come out in a couple of months so this is going to be better behind the behind the behind the um uh, behind the carpet but this is august 2021 at the time private investment was about 1.7 billion us dollars um and the number of fusion companies at the time was about 23 um, since that was announced in August, uh, a company uh, spin out from MIT managed to raise 1.8 billion um, called Commonwealth Fusion Systems to build their uh, magnet fusion reactor uh, by 2025. Uh, a company, this is an Australian company, came out and, and announced their, their fundraise. General Fusion, um, another company from Canada, raised the £130 million pounds since, since this report. And then Helion Energy, a, a company uh, based in Seattle in Washington state, raised uh, approximately 2.2 billion of private investment for their fusion approach. Um, very different fusion approach, um, I, I, um, but I won't go into that any yet. So now 2022 comes along, August, a uh, new report comes out, and now they've summed up that 4.8 billion, uh, since the last one was 1.7, now it's 4.8 billion of US dollars have been invested into fusion. Sounds a lot, um, it is a lot of money, but um, what fusion are predicting in the next coming decade is this is not enough. Um, a demonstration plan alone would be in the billions of um, dollars, depending on the approach you take on fusion. Um, some people may argue against that, depending on the fusion type you do. But if you do magnet confined fusion, you're looking at billions scale for a reactor design uh, and build. So uh, this is still a, a drop in the ocean on what's required to get fusion, um, at least in a commercial state. But you can see the uh, there's, there is momentum, there is um, interest from uh, investors uh, and and uh, I anticipate a question that's uh, what type of investors are there in this so you've got people who are like in single people so um wealthy wealthy individuals uh bill gates invested jeff bezos has invested various silicon valley people uh, have invested as well um but you also got now more traditional investors more like oil and gas companies are, are now interested in fusion and, and investing in that um and a bottom bottom right you can see there's a little um uh, graph there, which is it's it's a bit it's a bit um it's a foregone conclusion graph really because it was a question asked to all the fusion companies when do you want your fusion power on the grid, and most people have chosen 2031 2035. Uh, the interesting question uh, we'll monitor as the years go on is how does that graph change as you develop further and further your fusion uh, devices and and tackle the fusion challenges and engineering challenges and in this case for us material challenges, um, how does that but change the shift more towards the right hand side where you end up starting to come in. Well, actually, first electricity may be a bit later because of certain things they haven't anticipated, or vice versa. There could be some breakthroughs that brings it forward. Um, but it's just an interesting note. So uh, we keep track of uh, since that report. Another one first that fusion raised more money. That's a UK company spin out from Oxford University. Um, they're based in Oxfordshire. Uh, Kyoto Engineering um, has raised 18.6 million, which is a um, Japanese fusion company. Actually, since then, I haven't updated it, but they've also raised another 80 million US dollars, which was announced a few weeks ago um, on, on this. And then you've got more Zap Energy, another company based in, again, Seattle, Washington, raised 160 million. And then this is the last one, the most important one, is Department of Energy announces, US Department of Energy announces 50 million, which is a very small number, but it's the beginnings of a program 
milestone based fusion development program. And there's another, and the UK uh, announces more money for the fusion industry program, which I'll kind of skip over, but the UK is also funding a lot of private companies for a, for this thing called fusion industry program, for which also Oxford Sigma is a recipient of some of the funding for. Other things to note in the UK, Topmag Energy, a private company based in again Oxfordshire uh, in, in, in Milton Park, reaches uh, 100 million degrees with their Tokamak or commercial, a, um, confinement fusion. Uh, machine magnet component fusion machine, which you can see there's a picture of it. That's the real, uh, it's a small spherical tokamak, uh, but they reached a world record uh, for a spherical tokamak geometry, which is a type of technology, and it reached 100 million degrees. So that was very good. And that was in March last year. Um, we're going over the pond, Cornwall Fusion Systems, another company which I mentioned, the spin out of MIT, uh, which, which was secured $1.8 billion to build this facility you're seeing, which, is, which will be called Spark. Um, this is a picture from June 2022. So they're currently constructing their building, and there you can just see a pit, a concrete pit where the where the uh, fusion reactor will sit. Um, moving on a bit, this is February the 10th to 2023. So this year, um, this is the same company. Um, what you can see is two buildings, and this is in Massachusetts uh, state. Here in the foreground is their magnet winding building, and in the in the rear is where the top rack is going to sit. So they're fully well ahead, you know, producing their fusion reactor. And their goal by 2025 is to demonstrate Q greater than one um, in their energy system um, that hasn't been done yet in a, in a, in a magnet confined fusion. It's been con conducted in laser fusion, but not magnet confined. Um, more news, it keeps coming. Um, so in June 21, General Fusion, the Canadian company, um, decided to build its demonstration plant at Cullum in the UK. Uh, and this is on the back backdrop of the regulatory certainty that I mentioned before. So then the UK made its stake on how it's going to regulate fusion, at least these design reactors, these experimental reactors at uh, UK Atomic Energy Authority in Cullen, where they all already know how to operate fusion reactors and have the safety systems in, in place of handling deuterium and lithium. It's a very, it makes a lot of sense for these private companies to use that because the government is assisting the private companies to achieve commercial uh, commercialization. So General Fusion decided, you know, announced in 2021, 2023 this year, uh, First Light Fusion announced um, their demonstration plant to be built at Carlum as well. And then also Tokamak Energy um, has announced their um, future device called um, ST, um, ST80 uh, to be built in February. Uh, uh, announced in February, sorry, uh, to be built in the years to come out on the Carlum campus as well. So you can see that the UK Atomic Energy Authority is really hosting this supply chain and this industry and really fostering and trying to enable it. As best it can to be successful in its commercial pathway. Because you look at them, I mean, without knowing any about the details of the reactor, they're all fundamentally different approaches to fusion. Uh, general fusion does uh, magneto inertial fusion, first light fusion does just pure inertial fusion, and then whereas uh, Tokamak McGendy does uh, the magnet component. Very different ways of doing fusion energy. Um, I'll skip on this. Uh, the last thing I mentioned before going to some technical stuff is last week the US Department of Energy announces who wins the milestone based public private partnership. This was that uh, SpaceX model which I mentioned, uh, model of SpaceX. So uh, lots of private fusion companies have uh, put proposals forward um, and the idea is that the US Department gave uh, approximately 50 million uh, to these, 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 these companies here and you can recognize some of them as so Commonwealth Fusion Systems are here and so it's talking about energy there's other ones, SAP Energy, etc. And the idea behind this is you have 18 months ish approximate to demonstrate a preconceptual design um, uh, by doing various, meeting various milestones, releasing the cash. So it's a way of the government, at least US government, to reach milestones and then receive funding. So this way the taxpayers are protected and the investment risk is mainly taken on by the companies. So the other investors matching that, um, not the government. So it's a very uh, it's been successful to get SpaceX to to provide services for NASA, and this is the intent. So this is the beginnings of the program. Um, this will march on as the years go on, and the money will increase and increase as the projects get more developed. And as as some of these companies may not meet their milestones, they may not meet their achievements, and because of technical reasons, however it may be, whereas others will meet their milestones and they will advance on. And the idea is to down select to the most appropriate um, technologies to be able to to demonstrate uh, electricity production in the United States. So that's kind of state of the industry. Um, I, I want to spend just a couple of minutes because um, uh, on some things that we look at a bit of a bit of an idea about real logical challenges and fusion uh, because uh, of the audience and, and stuff. And for us, it's also what we do. Um, um, so I want to give you a bit of an idea 
of um, what it looks like from these these devices, what they're going to create, releasing the power station configuration, not an experimental device. It all comes down to neutron flux. Um, one of the reasons comes under neutron flux. So here is a, your neutron spectrum you receive from various different reactors, um, and this is provided by um, uh, a UKA member, Mark Gilbert. Um, in neutron spectrum, the most important thing you need to know is the black line is that's what a a magnetic confined fusion reactor is going to produce. So neutrons neutrons cause uh, activation causes radiation. You've also got gamma rays, etc. So how does that look like? And I kind of want to just dive into a little bit. Um, how that kind of looks like over a facility, and then how would we maybe mitigate some of the ideas and mitigate some of the challenges with that associated. Um, this is so back to ITER, that large reactor construction in South France. So it was under construction, but obviously we've done a lot. Um, the community's done a lot of um, work on uh, modeling the radiological uh, sort of hazards around during operation. But as you can see on the left, this is um, if you know, this is an MCMP uh, paper, which is referenced at the bottom if you're ever interested. But just the things to give you a bit of an idea. So um, some see the scale here. This is meters if you can just read it. This is where the tokamak is going to sit, and these are all the different concrete portholes of various instruments coming in. But this is during op uh, biological dose of microsieverts per hour uh, of neutrons during operation of the plasma. And as you can see, this is you know um, these red areas going to be about uh, four times ten to the seven uh, microsieverts per hour, um, which is about you know tens of micro tens of sieverts per hour. And obviously it, it mitigates down. That's during operation. Then you've also got um, the active activated pipes and cross that um, after uh, a million seconds after shutdown. So it gives you a bit of an idea about the radiological uh, fields around uh, these devices. Um, and this is just an experimental device, uh, which is to demonstrate technology. This is not power production, 24 seven operation for, for years to come. Um, so there are some challenges, you know, some of these are very traditional challenges uh, in radiological protection, um, uh, but there are some uh, more unique challenges that we as a company face, and this is mainly to do with the material selection of your power station. So there is currently um, uh, a criteria or more a, a goal that the fusion community want to achieve in this sentence here. Uh, so the material selection for fusion energy nuclear waste production after initial 100 years of removal from a reactor uh, of a power station that is can be disposed as a low level waste repository so that we know what low level waste means certain amount of uh, uh becker hours per kilogram for, for whatever it may be depending on which jurisdiction you're in uh, if it's uk or france or the united states we'll define it differently but you can look on the periodic table and it's basically the red ones is that after a thousand years or greater much greater that's when it will become low level waste in the uk so we want to mi minimize as much waste as possible for this technology um, and not have a, so much of a burden uh, for the future. Um, so just things to point out, which is now not allowed to use. So uh, nickel is not allowed to be used in fusion reactors. Um, you got uh, zinc. Um, you've also think got like nitrogen, uh, niobium, molybdenum. Um, I mentioned these on purpose. Uh, and then you've also got various things uh, like um, cobalt, but that's 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 a given anyway. Um, and these are useful because they are alloying elements in steels and in construction materials, so we can't use them. So we have to think about new low activation materials, which is kind of where fusion sits. Um, there's a lot of other ones here which are um, for different reasons have ruled out. Um, so you take that principle um, and the idea is that this is a, a brilliant paper from uh, again from UKA from from Mark Gilbert. You can work out the neutron flux spectrum for this. In this case, this is a demo. Uh, a EU demo program for a power station. So this is neutron flux, and you can see it obviously um, decreases out. Then this is uh, various um, uh, to uh, cassette. But it, you can able to work out the activation on certain structural materials and sort of decay. You, this is this this is what we do as a company. We end up designing new materials, which and and, and finessing new materials, which become more um, palatable for fusion uh, under 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 the waste management. So. Uh, I'll go one or two, but we'll just take the standard grade P16 of steel, which is your standard nuclear grade material. Um, but as you can see, this is the after shutdown, after operation. Um, this is your weeks up top, your your normal time, obviously got log scale and second at the bottom. But you can see the Becquerel of beta and gamma activity is pretty high um, if you take the black curve in summation. But you can see the offending isotope, this nickel 63, which is um, the red line here, which causes a lot of uh, the activation to become. 
intermediate level waste for a very long time. The blue line, by the way, is low level waste uh, criterion. So you have to be below that. So we um we come up with new materials. So for example, you can you can pick out. Uh, I'm going to skip this due to time, but tungsten is a good example. We work on tungsten a lot as a co in our company. Um, it's a very useful material for um, basin plasmas. But if you neutron irradiate tungsten, um, and it's again a black line, you can see the combination of all the isotopes, but it achieves the low level uh, criteria, you know, um, 20 years, 20, uh, 20 years or so uh, after shutdown, so it becomes low level waste. Uh, this is the sort of goals that we are achieving uh, in fusion. Uh, and again, it is to, it's to, it's the idea is to remove um, the burden of waste in the future. It does provide challenges on selecting materials for operation, and um, so that's what we do as, as, a, as a company. Um, the other things I'm going to skip, but there's like residual heat, as you would expect. There's some heat to manage from the decay. Um, we 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 know how to do that. There's a way of designing that here as well. Other things to consider about um, some activated components and fusion. And again, these are for power station devices, not extended to ones being built in column, for example, is if you have various uh, components and you take them off um, either for maintenance or for you know a replacement. Some of those components can actually heat up to an appreciable temperature range, you know, 50 to 250 degrees, depending on design and material choice. It's very, very dependent on lots of things. And you know, you, how much time do you have to sit in storage? So it says about six years got to sit in storage to ensure a lot of reactive decay is gone um, before you can start safely um, packaging it up, for example. So these are things which are coming in now to some of the diffusion designs to be able to optimize this sort of scenario and minimize that sort of scenario. Um, oh, and I've got a, a range of um, References if anyone's ever interested in, in sort of the, the surroundings part uh, and all the um, sort of approaches that people are taking infusion to minimize sort of this, these um, waste challenges, but also some of the safety, sort of traditional safety challenges and related to um, radioactive sources. Um, and I got last slide and I'll finish, but where does Oxygen Sigma fit in all this into fusion? So I'll start out with how fusion looks like as a kind of a global thing, the regulatory aspects in countries. Eaters construction from the world government of a demonstration device. Then you've also got, you know, the United States currently um, deciding how it's going to uh, put fusion onto their grid and how the private fusion industry is coming in, the investments coming to the private fusion industry. And then where we sit in that sort of little ecosystem, um, as you can see, there's a lot of things going on in fusion. Um, there's a lot more things going to come ahead in the next five to 10 years because a lot of this money, which has been promised, has to result into things being demonstrated. So we're slowly getting there. As you can see, there are some very good milestones, like 100 million degrees from atomic energy for this plasma. Uh, we've got to keep demonstrating being successful in the technology roadmap. Um, so really quickly, where do we sit? So we're a small company in this in this um, ecosystem, which is building. You know, our sort of vision is that we we are we want to tackle you know energy security and climate change by the way we do that by helping fusion energy get to where it needs to be. How we do that, and that's the mission is we develop our own technology on materials for power station designs and then help the industry come up with material solutions and then also provide some niche design services uh, in uh, sort of the commercial fusion reactor designs um, so we have a, a team of people doing it. the last thing just a bit of highlights about who we are so i've kind of mentioned it throughout but you know we mainly focus on fusion materials designs of components in reactors um, we're a global company we work in many countries now um, we're driven by scientific principles it's worth mentioning um, we work on construction code um, development as well um, we have a vast network um, and things like that but one thing about people ask us all the time and I'll, I'll say it is that what, what does sigma mean in Oxford sigma and actually derives by um, or the initial principle is that because in our day-to-day -day work we use a lot of nuclear cro reaction cross sections uh, in our in our workflow and that's designated with the um, Greek symbol sigma um, and sort of location, if people know, most people might know on the call, I don't know, um, but where is Harwell? Um, obviously there's Oxford in the centre map here. Um, Harwell is just a science, really large science campus down below. Uh, used to be the old uh, UKA Harwell site. And then um, various private companies are all around Cullum, as you can see Cullum down here. That's that features above here. We, we work very closely with Oxford University. Um, so you can see this is kind of the, in the UK, this is the centre right now of where Fusion is in Oxfordshire. Um, and all of our customers, clients, partnerships all around in this country are based here. And then we also do uh, 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 spend a lot of time in the United States as well. Um, 
So in summary, last slide, you know, covered off all things, um, hopefully which of interest to you and give you a bit of an insight into where Fusion is, but where the public programs sit, where the private sector companies kind of sit, the, I'll keep an eye on the milestone based program from USDOE as the announcements come out over the years to come. That's something to keep watch of. Uh, same with the UK step program. A um, bit about realizable challenges during operation and then kind of after operation. So, so things, you know, uh, when you operate, how what's the sort of radiological map look like and what does it look like from a waste perspective and how we as a company, but also as a community, trying to optimize the selection and the choice of materials to minimize the long term challenges and, and the burden of fusion. And then obviously, where do we as a company sit in all this? Um, so that concludes my talk brief on this. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of what the current state of play looks like. Thank you for listening.